justice will be brought before man. Now you shall have to explain your whole life span. What you did in the open and what you conceive. From big to small. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode in our series on the journey to the afterlife, where we have begun discussing the topics of the journey of the soul after death, as well as the topic of the day of resurrection, yawm al-qiyamah, and we began discussing the topic of the hellfire, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you and I from the punishment of the hellfire. Today, inshaAllah ta'ala, we want to talk about some of the sins that lead to the hellfire. And these could be sins of believers as well as disbelievers. But our focus is on sins that sometimes some of the believers will fall into. And so we want to be aware and we want to protect ourselves from the punishment of the hellfire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who have believed, protect yourselves, save yourselves and your families from the hellfire. So protect yourself by knowing what causes a person to be led to the hellfire. Now when it comes to the issues of sins and the things that are prohibited in Islam, the things that are haram, are absolutely prohibited. Oftentimes, a person who is ignorant, a person who doesn't know any better, they'll automatically assume that so many things are haram. Everything is haram. And all they hear about is what's haram. And they never focus on what's halal, what is permissible. When it comes to matters of Islam and matters of fiqh, jurisprudence, the things that are haram are listed, meaning there are not that many things. But right now, if you and I try to write down everything that is halal, everything that is permissible, we would not be able to because there are so many things in the dunya that are permissible. Even when it comes to certain matters, for example, with foods, if you had to write down all the foods that are halal and all the foods that are haram, you could write down the foods that are haram in less than a minute and the foods that are halal would take you years, perhaps, because we don't even know of all the foods in this world. There's so many foods. And so... When it comes to sins that lead to the hellfire, the topic of today, we want to make sure that everyone is aware that the things that lead to the hellfire are listed, meaning they are not that many things. But the things that are halal are beyond our explanation because there are so many things that are halal. So when it comes to matters of halal and haram, imagine a circle, a huge circle. Within that circle, there's a small dot, a small, tiny circle. That big circle is everything that is halal in this world. And the small dot inside this huge circle, that small dot is everything that's haram. There's very little. Today we're going to mention some of the things that are prohibited. And these things that are prohibited, my dear brothers and sisters, they are only prohibited because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates these things for our own benefit. Meaning these things that are haram do have some kind of harmful effect for us and for our families and for society in general. And so these things are protected by Allah and His commandments. So the things that are haram are things that are harmful for us. Let's cover some of the things, inshaAllah ta'ala. So someone came to Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah and they asked, what are the deeds of the people of the hellfire and what are some of the deeds of the people of paradise? So in regards to the people of the hellfire, because we're only discussing the hellfire today, he said the deeds of the, hell, the, the, deeds of the people of the hellfire are the following. And he began to list them. The list wasn't that long. There were about 30 or 40 things that he listed. However, you cannot begin to write down everything that is halal. It's beyond the millions. So, what is the first thing that he wrote that leads people to the hellfire? Associating partners in worship with Allah. Without a doubt. And we spoke about this in the last episode. The second one is to disbelieve in any of the messengers of Allah. Peace be upon them. Including Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the third is kufr, meaning ingratitude or disbelief, hiding the truth. The fourth, and some of the Muslims may fall into this, and this is one of the most dangerous sins in the world, 
one of the most powerful things in the world that will take a person astray. And that is malicious envy, hasad. Malicious envy is when you want someone else to lose what they have. It's a sickness, a disease of the heart, and we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this sickness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran, Am yahsuduna nasa ala ma atahumullahu min fadlih, or do they envy people for what Allah has given them of His bounty? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about this for our own benefit. Imam al Bukhari reports that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Do not envy one another. And do not hate one another and do not turn your backs on one another, meaning don't, uh, don't hold grudges and go apart. Don't separate from one another. Don't severe your ties. The Prophet ﷺ said, Envy, hasad, eats up the good deeds, the hasanat. It burns the hasanat just as fire consumes and eats up the wood, the firewood. Very quickly, it goes through it. Your hasanat will be burnt and melted through hasad. And you don't want your good deeds to be burned or to be removed. And the blameworthy type of hasad or envy is when you envy somebody else's blessings, when you envy that somebody has something. You want them to lose it. This is a sickness, wal-iyadu billah. And you hate its very existence. To the point where if that person loses their blessing, if they lose their blessing, you do not care that you don't also have it. Rather, you just don't want them to have it. You just don't want someone else to have something good. This is a very huge problem, a very sick disease of the heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us in our hearts. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells us, I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul, none of you will believe until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. This is reported by Imam al-Bukhari and muslim And if you love something for yourself, you love any kind of blessing or happiness for yourself, you should love blessings and happiness for other people. You should love for other people to be in a state of tranquility and blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Furthermore, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no envy, and this is not malicious envy, but there is no envy except in two matters. Meaning you're not allowed to have envy except for two things. The first is a man to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted wisdom, and so he rules by that wisdom and teaches it to the people. And in one translation or one narration, it was knowledge or knowledge of the Qur'an. And they teach it to the people. And the second is a man to whom Allah has granted a lot of wealth and property along with the power to spend in it for the cause of the truth, for the sake of Allah. So these are the only two things you're allowed to envy, meaning you're allowed to be jealous of these two, not in a malicious way where you want them to lose their blessings, rather in a way where you want to also do what they're doing. Because both of the things mentioned in the hadith also include the intention behind it. So one of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He teaches it for the people. And the second one, He uh, spreads or spends the charity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is purely for His sake and for the truth. And so both of these people are doing things for the sake of Allah. If you want to be like these people, you can ask Allah to make you like these people. But you don't want them to lose what they're doing. You do not want them to detract from this khair that they're doing. Now something very beautiful that one of the scholars said was Muhammad ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, one of the great scholars of the past. He said, I have never envied anyone over anything. Never had hasad or envy towards anyone for anything. Why? Listen to this very carefully. He said, if a person is going to be in the hellfire, how can I envy someone over some worldly matter when he is going to the hellfire? Why would I envy someone who is going to be punished? And the second, if he's going to paradise, how can I envy someone? How could I be envious of a person who is going to enter paradise with whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased? So how can you envy people? If they're going to paradise, that means Allah is pleased with them. Allah is pleased with them. How can you be envious of a man that Allah is pleased with? So do you have a problem with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Wa and the second is if he's going to the hellfire, how could you be envious of this person? If they're going to be punished. They're going to be punished. Now there are many stories and lessons for us in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that highlight the dangers of evil and envy. And malicious envy is a very terrible thing. And you remember the story of Prophet Yusuf ﷺ and how jealousy and envy led his brothers to trying to remove him from the family, trying to get rid of him by throwing him in the well. And look at what he went through for such a long period of time. For a lot of 
his, his life, he was in this state where he was far away from his family because his brothers had envy towards him. Furthermore, you look at the story of the two sons of Adam السلام, and they have the name of Habil and Qabil according to some scholars. You look at the story and when you look at that story, you see that one of the brothers was simply envious. He was jealous and that envy caused him to commit uh, murder, to commit crimes such as murder, the first murder that was ever committed. So you look at this and you wonder, how does it occur? How does someone reach a point where they have this much envy? The scholars say, envy is a result, it could be a result of enmity, having rivalry. It could be a result of pride. It could be self-esteem. It could be self-admiration. You love yourself so much when someone has something better or they're better at something, you start to envy them. Or love of leadership or power. Love of authority. Or this person might have an impurity in their soul. They might have a disease in their heart. And so this envy is simply a byproduct of that disease. Now, of course, enmity is the most serious cause because this leads to some kind of violence. This leads to some kind of action. And in turn, this causes a man to thirst for revenge, a person to thirst for revenge. And it might drive a person to glow over any calamity or hardship that afflicts his enemy. And this is a very dangerous thing. One of the scholars of the past said, Beware that envy is one of the deadliest diseases of the heart. And there is no medicine for the diseases of the heart except through knowledge, seeking knowledge, and doing good deeds. The knowledge that will treat the disease of the envy is to know, without any doubt, that envy is lethal for a person in this dunya and in the akhirah. This is the knowledge that you need. That envy is bad for you if you are envying somebody else. It might be bad for them as well, but it's bad for you if you're envying somebody else, and it's bad for you in your religion. And there is no danger from it to the envied person regarding his life or religion. Rather, on the contrary, the person that you're envying will benefit from you envying them because they will get some rewards for that. And then he said, the fact is that envy is dangerous for the person who's envying your own religion. It's true that this envy is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has predestined for somebody else. Allah has blessed somebody with something, rizq. So if Allah granted somebody a lot of wealth and you're envious of their wealth, if Allah granted somebody beauty and you're envious of their beauty, if Allah granted somebody fame or power or position or authority and you're envious of this person's blessings, then you are disappointed with what Allah has done. You are disappointed with Allah's decree. And this is something that harms you in your religion, something that harms you in your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Furthermore, the envier the one who is doing the envy, the one who hates what other people have, they would basically share with shaitan and with the disbelievers a life, a love for crisis to befall people. So shaitan loves for people to lose their blessings. He loves for people to lose their blessings and the disbelievers as well. And so when you're envying somebody else, you're falling into the same exact category. So the person who suffers from envy in this life, they are suffering consistently through their life. Because in this life, when you're envying somebody else, you will always feel sad. You will always feel like you don't have enough. You will always be looking at what other people have. And you will never, ever be happy in the dunya or in the akhirah. So my dear brothers and sisters, beware, beware, beware of the disease of envy. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from that and to purify our hearts. We're going to take a short break, inshallah ta'ala, and we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Of justice will be broke before. Disease of the heart known as envy, malicious envy or hasad in Arabic and how this is something that the people who do it will have a sadness and a depression and it will affect them in their own uh, religion, in their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they are disappointed with how Allah has blessed certain people and Allah chooses how to spread these blessings. So instead of envying somebody else, make dua, oh Allah bless this person with what they have and grant me the same. If you like something, ask Allah for it. And ask Allah to give that person that you're looking at something even better, to grant them barakah in it, blessings in it. So don't ever look at somebody and wish for them to lose the khayr. This is a very terrible disease, and this is the disease that shaitan had himself, and we will talk about that inshallah ta'ala in a future episode. Now some of the other sins that were listed are lying, and lying is one of the things that leads to punishment in the dunya and in the akhirah. And the one who lies often will be written in a book with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as one of the liars. Another thing is treachery. Another thing that was listed is oppression, zulm, to wrong other people. This person will suffer on the Day of Judgment and in this world. Another thing that was listed by the scholar was promiscuity, which is fornication with multiple partners, sleeping with multiple partners. 
Another thing that was listed is backstabbing. And this is something that is deep and it is a long topic, but backstabbing will receive a terrible punishment starting in the dunya and especially in the grave. The people who backstab others will be punished in the grave and on the day of resurrection. Mm. As well as cutting off the ties of kinship. Cutting off the ties of kinship. Now this is something that happens a lot in our times and it's something that we should talk about for a few minutes. Imam al-Bukhari says, whoever cuts off their relatives will not enter paradise. Whoever cuts off their relatives will not enter paradise. You cut off your family, you cut off your friends, you'll not enter paradise. Why? If it's your family. Because this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved for you. And Islam preserves it for you. And it is not something that you should cut off. A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he said, O Messenger of Allah, I have relatives with whom I try to keep in touch. And they continue to cut me off. I try to keep in touch with them, but they continue to cut me off. I treat them well, but they, but they treat me harshly, really badly. I try to be kind to them, but they are cruel to me. And then he said, if you are, as you say, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you are, as you're saying to me, then it is as if you are putting hot ashes in their mouths. You will continue to have support from Allah, the acceptance from Allah against them as long as you continue doing what you're doing. This is reported by Imam Muslim. So if you, my dear brothers or sisters, have relatives who are cutting you off, but you are trying to reach out to them, and you are treating them well, you're giving them their rights, then this is all that you have to do. Continue doing what you're doing, as long as it's not harming you physically. Continue doing what you're doing. Fulfill their rights. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support you, as long as you're doing that. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever likes that his wealth, his sustenance, becomes abundant, Meaning, whoever likes his wealth, his sustenance to become expanded. We all like our wealth to be expanded, right? And his age to be longer. Your wealth to be expanded and your age to be longer. Let this person keep good relations with his relatives. And so the Prophet ﷺ is telling you that one of the blessings of upholding the ties of relatives and kinship is that Allah will bless you in your wealth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause your age even to be expanded. Islam calls for the upholding of the ties of kinship because of the great effect that this has on achieving social cohesion and perpetuating cooperation and love amongst the Muslims. So it brings about a good part of society, a great effect on society, and it brings about a great effect for the love of Muslims and the love of the Ummah. And division and disunity and enmity are from the shaitan. Dividing between families and relatives, this is from the shaitan. So seek refuge in Allah from the traps of shaitan. If you have a relative or someone who has wronged you, forgive them and reach out to them. Forgive them and reach out to them. And if somebody is wronged by you, then you should apologize and reach out to them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold you accountable for it in the dunya and on the day of resurrection. Now some of the other things that were listed by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. He said, miserliness is one of the things that leads to punishment. What is miserliness? It is when you're stingy with your wealth. Stingy with your money, meaning you have a lack, a complete lack of generosity. You're not spending on anyone or anything, even yourself perhaps. You don't like to spend your wealth. You just love the wealth so much that you accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. Even when it comes to your own family, your spouse, your children, your parents, your friends, the poor in society, the charitable organizations that need your help. So when you become stingy and you don't like to spend, this, something, this is something that leads to punishment. Something else that was listed is inconsistency between what is in your heart and what is on your face shown to the people. So try to keep it consistent. Be the same person that you are everywhere, the same Muslim, strong Muslim wherever you are. How would you act if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was with you? How would you act if you were with Muslims and then with non-Muslims? Keep your faith strong. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also warned us about despairing from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله Do not despair from the mercy of Allah. So this is something that was listed. Because when you despair from the mercy of Allah, you're saying that Allah's mercy is not wide enough for you. It's not vast enough for you. Whereas the reality is that it's beyond vast. Another sin that was listed is to feel secure from the plan of Allah. To think you're going to get away with something that Allah has planned. To bypass it somehow. وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَكَرِينَ they plot and they scheme. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan. And Allah is the greatest of planners. 
Furthermore, one thing that was listed by the scholar is panicking blindly at the time of crisis. And this is because a person needs to put their faith in Allah. Some people at the time of crisis, they begin to lose their faith. So somebody dies and they lose their faith. They say, why did Allah do this? Or they say something like, why is Allah SWT doing this to me? Why does this happen to me? Don't question Allah's decree. At the time that it strikes, that's when you need to be strong. Some people when it happens, they start to use profanity. Other people say, La ilaha illallah. Other people say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Alladheena idha asabatum musibatun qalu, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To Allah we belong and to Him is our return. Another thing that was listed is pride and extravagance at the time of plenty. So when you have a lot of money or a lot of wealth, to be prideful of it, to show off with it. Oh, I have this, I'm better. Or I'm this, and I have this status. And to be extravagant, to waste it. And this is something that happens a lot, unfortunately, in a lot of Islamic cultures. Meaning in a lot of societies where there's a lot of Muslims, people are extravagant with their wealth. Especially at times that is unnecessary, like the wedding days. And subhanAllah, the more you spend, the less barakah there is in it. But the more you spend for the cause of Allah, the more barakah there is in it. Another thing that was mentioned is to transgress the limits of Allah, to violate the sanctity of Allah, to fear the people more than you fear Allah, to feel the created more than the creator. Uh, showing off riya, we talked about this in depth in a previous episode. Going against the Quran or the Sunnah in word or in action. Obeying someone, a created being, over obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mocking the signs of Allah or mocking the religion, rejecting the truth, withholding testimony that should be used to help someone. It should be revealed. Black magic and witchcraft, this is something that's in depth needs to be discussed. Wal-iyadu billah. Disobeying and disrespecting your parents. This leads to punishment in the dunya. Lack of blessings in the dunya, even before the akhirah. And we will talk about this in one entire episode, inshaAllah. Killing any soul forbidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except for reasons of justice. Consuming the wealth of the orphan. Riba, usury, which we will talk about, inshaAllah ta'ala. Desertion from the battlefield. And slandering the reputation of innocent believing woman. And this is something that was mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the people of the hellfire are of five types, five kinds of people. The weak who lack the power to avoid evil. The carefree who pursue everything. These are the people that will do whatever they want to do with no concern for their families or wealth. They don't care. They're careless people. The third is the dishonest people whose greed cannot be concealed even from you know, the minor issues. The fourth are the people who betray you morning and evening with regards to your family and your property. And the fifth, he mentioned the misers, the liars, and those people who are in the habit of abusing people, and the ones who use foul, obscene language. So when they become angry, even some Muslims, when they become angry, they'll start to curse at you, they'll start to say things, they'll start to be angry, they'll say all of these horrible things that they later regret. But that moment of horror, and terror and obscene foul language is something that is punishable. So seek knowledge to dispel this and practice to dispel this. And this hadith is reported by Imam Muslim. Now one time, there's a very incident, uh, interesting story in which Ali radiallahu an went to the masjid and he stopped outside where he saw a man standing at the door. So he told him, can you hold my mount for my animal? So the man said, okay, I will do so. Ali radiallahu anhu had two dirhams in his hand when he exited from the masjid. So he prayed, he was leaving, he took out two dirhams to give to this man for taking care of his horse or his camel. Mm. He comes outside and he doesn't see the man there, but the horse is still there. And the reins, the saddles on the horse are gone. The man had stolen them, presumably. So Ali radiallahu anhu tells his servant to please go to the marketplace and purchase new reins so that he could ride his horse. He leaves and he comes back. When he comes back, he says, I found the same exact reins that belong to you in the marketplace. And I bought them, I purchased them for two dirhams. And Ali radiallahu anhu says to him, indeed, the slave forbids himself from lawful permissible sustenance by abstaining from patience, by being impatient. So, you might be prevented from something pure, something good for you, because you were impatient and you went and found it or took it in a haram manner, in a way that is not permissible in Islam. This man was going to get two dirhams anyway from Ali radiallahu anhu. He was going to get it as a gift. 
but he was impatient. So he thought to himself, I'll steal this, I'll go sell it, and I'll make money. So he made money in a haram way, prohibited wealth, and now that money is contaminated. Now that money will cause him when he eats with that wealth. Now his dua is rejected, his clothing is a form of contamination. But if he had waited just a little longer, he would have, re would have received the same two dirhams, but in a permissible manner. And they would have been pure for him. I had a, a person who was in my masjid a few months ago after I gave a lecture on the topic of interest, riba, usury, and how it is bad for the individual and for the family and for society and why it's haram. Now somebody came up to me afterwards and he said, you know what, I'm being offered a job right now at another company, another business, and they are offering me so much more for the salary than what I currently receive. And it's almost double than, than what I'm receiving right now. However, I would have to work with Riba. I would have to create software that does the Riba calculations for this bank, this company. He said, I really wanted to take the job because it would have been good for me and my family. It's more wealth. But he said, after I heard this talk about interest, I decided I would rather uh, you know, ref uh, restrain myself and refrain from doing something that Allah hates. Subhanallah. He passed up this offer. He passed off this offer, remembering all the time that if you leave something for the sake of Allah, Allah will give you something better. He received an offer from his own company where he was still working. They did not know about this issue. One week later, subhanAllah, only seven days, one week later they informed this person, this man, that he was being given an offer as a promotion in his own company where what he was doing was still halal, in his own company a promotion to a much higher position and his salary would have been the same as the company that he was going to leave, the company that he was going to, the one that had him do this interest job. He rejected that offer, rejected their salary and increase. He stayed in his own company and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah increased him in his wealth by offering him a promotion in his own company. Not only that, they granted him so many benefits and other things in the company that he wasn't offered in the other place. All because he was patient and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him in his wealth and he refrained from doing something haram. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him in that. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us in our wealth and to purify our actions and to grant us patience and to protect us from the sins that lead to the hellfire. This concludes our episode for today. Join us next time inshallah ta'ala as we continue talking about the deeds of the inhabitants. Jazakumullah khaira wa sallillahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajba'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The of justice will be brought before man Now you shall have to explain your whole life span what you did in the open and what you conceive From big to small shall today be revealed Your deeds shall then be weighed in escape This shall determine if you pass or fail